friends, welcome back to Colliding Worldviews. A couple of months ago was the first time I gave my brand new 2019 edition of the Muslim Brotherhood Origin, Identity, and Agenda. You can find that presentation on my Vimeo channel, V-I-M-E-O dot com forward slash Tony Grulay. So I was giving this presentation for the first time in public, and when I showed up, a man walked up to me and introduced himself, and it was a, a great extreme honor to have him come to my presentation on the Muslim Brotherhood. And today, it's an honor to have him here on Colliding Worldviews for a couple of episodes. He is Philip Haney. He studied Arabic culture and language while working as a scientist in the Middle East before he was hired as a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security in 2003. After becoming an armed customs and border protection officer, he served two tours of duty at the National Targeting Center near Washington, D.C., where he quickly was promoted to its advanced targeting team. For more than 40 years, he has specialized in Islamic theology and the strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement. He retired honorably in July of 2015. Philip Haney, welcome to Colliding Worldviews. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, friend. It's great to have you, Phil, because I want to introduce people to your book if they have never heard of it, and definitely if they don't have a copy. It's called See Something, Say Nothing. A Homeland Security officer's Officer Exposes the Government's Submission to Jihad, forward by Michelle Bachman. This is the book. If you don't have a copy, go to Amazon or wherever books are sold and get a copy of this. Now, even if it's not available brand new, get a used copy of it. Buy a few copies for yourself and for other people as well. Because people are wondering today, how did we get from 9-11 to Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar as being Muslim congresswomen? Phil's book connects the dots in more ways than one and will completely uh, fill in the gap of where we have come from and where we are now and why we are where we are now. Phil, you had years of experience with the DHS. You retired honorably. In this book, you fill in all the dots of what has happened. Uh, what, what, what was the main reason why you wrote this book? Because I wanted people to know this part of the history of our country from the 9-11 attacks in September right up until really present time and you're right its story does fill in the, the blanks people are wondering how did we get from those moments after 9-11 when we were all unified working together till now where we're in a deep state of, uh, of argument and political uh, dissension and how did people who claim that their goal is to uh, die for the sake of Allah and to replace our constitution with Sharia end up being elected to public offices, positions in Congress and other positions of authority. And that's what the book talks about, step by step, year by year, uh, from right after 9-11, right up until about uh, the year 2016. And you wrote in your book, and this is what you had uh, referred to in 2012, I had watched the DHS, again, that's Department of Homeland Security, beginning with the George W. Bush administration, move from a law enforcement-based approach to national security to a civil rights-based policy that became known as countering violent extremism, or CVE emphasizing engagement and dialogue. Countering violent extremism focuses on protecting civil rights and civil liberties, not of American citizens in general, but particularly of Muslims, both citizens and foreigners, who in many instances are associated with a threat to the nation's security. Philip, how did we go from this law enforcement approach? And people can remember, if they think back to what happened right when the DHS was formed and uh, what it was like to travel back in the early 2000s after that compared to how it is today. And people who've kept up with the news have seen, uh, they haven't had it in this specific wording, but they have noticed, well, we went from 
uh, seeing uh, what happened on 9-11 to today, having, again, the Muslim congresswoman, and we're having many Muslims run for all different types of political office throughout the United States, and it's just going to happen more and more and more, as you and I both know. Uh, how did this transformation or evolution of DHS take place? Well, it started out with primarily at the tail end of President Bush's administration. I'm talking about 2006, 7, and 8. And the most polite way I can put it is that President Bush basically pulled the car over to the side of the road and just sat there and essentially till it ran out of gas. It's like he disengaged. And I say that the marking point was 2006 because the first two or three years of the agency, we were actually able to do the job that we were given authority to do, which is to help protect America from terrorism and the threat of terrorism. And we were able to interview individuals coming entry or seeking entry and determine whether we should let them in or not. And then at the same time, the last half of 2006, I started seeing people coming in that were affiliated with the group now known as Tablighi Jamaat. It originates out of the Indian subcontinent from a city in India called Deoband, so they're called the Deobandis. But also at the same time, I was studying and tracking members of the Muslim Brotherhood. So you had two big branches of Islam that I was looking at, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Tablighi Jamaat. And as it turns out, those are basically the major pieces in, in, the, in the equation for what became known as Al-Qaeda. It's a coalition of originally founded by five individuals, including Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri. But what we don't hear about as much is that there were also 14 different international level organizations that formed a coalition. And half of them were the Deobandi groups, like what we hear of every day, the Taliban and Lash Taiba and Tablighi Jamaat and Tawheed Jamaat. But somehow, mysteriously, though, that whole side of the equation was, was remained off the law enforcement radar. But I started noticing it in around 2006 and submitting information into the intelligence database. And eventually that case is what propelled me to go up to the National Targeting Center, which is outside of Washington, D.C., where I worked on in the advanced targeting team, we call it the ATT, which uh, is just that, advanced. And I worked on the Tablighi Jamaat case while I was at the NTC. And I also maintained my involvement with the Muslim Brotherhood side of the equation too. But uh, somewhere along that line, I started running headlong into the policies of the Obama administration. Remember, he was elected in November of 2008. So I have earlier mentioned how things started to go sideways at the tail end of 2006. Well, by a year and a half later, uh, President Obama was elected, and he made it quite clear from the very beginning that he was gonna, had a completely different worldview on this nature of this threat we faced, and it wouldn't be based on law enforcement. It would be based on... Uh, protecting the civil rights and civil liberties of foreign nationals and basically handcuffed us, made it impossible for us to do our job in interviewing people and developing, connecting the dots as we call it, um, and letting people come into the country that otherwise we should never have let in. And so that's where my head-on collision came with the entire Obama administration. That's, I ended up being investigated nine times by the very same people that are investigating President Trump. I mean specifically Brennan, Clapper, Comey, Napolitano, Holder, Johnson, the very same roster of people that we hear every day on the news were in the government at that time and they were going after people like myself in the same way that they're going after President Trump but it was behind the walls of the agencies where it wasn't so visible as it is now. And uh, 
by God's grace, I survived those nine investigations over a 10-year period. And meanwhile, my former career as a scientist, I was an entomologist. I work in field agriculture, particularly in the Middle East, which is where, where I got my exposure to the Islamic world. And I'd also been studying theology, Islamic theology, and Quranic Arabic all the time, well before 9-11. And that's what put me in a position to have this uh, background and set of skills when 9-11 came, I volunteered to join DHS. I was accepted and I went in as a founding member and began developing intelligence-based analysis of individuals and organizations of with possible connections to terrorism. Using an entomology allegory, I say that it's like ants. You follow the trail, you find the nest. Well, I did it the same way in counterterrorism, and that's what got me into so much trouble. First of all, they tried to just ignore the information, which is the normal response, just pretend it doesn't exist. Then the second thing they did was to start eliminating it out of the classified database. And the third thing that they do in this sequence is uh, to go after the people that put the information in the system in the first place. So all three of those things happened. First they ignored it, then they deleted it, and then they came after people like myself. And that's a lot of what is discussed in See Something, Say Nothing, which of course is a play on words of the phrase that we've heard a million times, see something, say something. Problem is they never tell you what to see, what you should be looking for, nor do they tell you what you should say. And most people have found out if they do try to say something, they end up getting in trouble. And that's exactly what happened with me. All because I would say that an individual or organization has got direct, obvious ties to terrorism. And I would be told, no, you don't have the right to make those assumptions. You're biased. You're possibly racist. You're reckless. You're careless with your authority. And we need to stop you. And that's basically what happened. Remember, I'm not talking about American citizens here. I'm talking about foreign nationals, people that are coming to the country to seek admission, to come into the country, which is what we yeah. were founded to do in the first place. So it was a, it was a cataclysm. It was a catastrophe, a, a major confrontation between law enforcement, national security, border protection, and the political ideology of the Obama administration who chose to make allies with these very same people, these very same individuals and organizations that law enforcement officers were tracking. So obviously something had to give. And so it did give. They thought they shut down the people that were doing the law enforcement work and promoted their policy. And that's essentially a long explanation to how we got from 9-11 to where we are today, where it's virtually forbidden to talk about this subject in public. If you do, just look at Jeanine Pirro or any other number. Look what just happened with Raymond Ibrahim in the, in the uh, military college. He was going to talk about his book, Sword and Scimitar. Care, a front group for Hamas, has the influence in our society to intrude itself into the affairs of the war college and prevent a Raymond Ibrahim from speaking. So if you needed proof about what, what I say in the book, See Something, Say Nothing, is it really still true today, just ask Raymond Ibrahim. That's the most recent, and that's in the domestic arena. What about in the foreign policy arena? That's a whole nother area of discussion. And Philip, probably one thing that people don't even realize is that a few days after 9-11, when President Bush proclaimed Islam is peace, standing right behind him were a number of men. One of them was Nihad Awad, the current executive director of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. And you may have seen more recent pictures of him standing next to Linda Sarsour or uh, other people. And he is definitely still at work, just like CARE, of course, is still at work here in America. And you talk about in your book how even being part of DHS and in the position that you were in, you guys were told not only to watch what you say, but how to say it. Because just as CARE 
and the different Islamist groups in America want us to have a new lingo about how we talk about Muslims, how we talk about Islam. Same thing happened for you. You guys were given a uh, words matter memo, which talked about terminology when you're talking about uh, this whole subject and, and what terms to use, what terms may be offensive. And when President Obama on June 4th, 2009, gave his new beginning speech, where was that? At Al-Azhar University, the most prestigious Islamic university in the world in Cairo, Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood leaders were sitting in the front row, and he's basically letting them know about this new policy that isn't focused on uh, terrorism, quote unquote, but violent extremism, which, you know, uh, no surprise, anyone from any religion can fall under that. And we're more focused now on the civil rights and liberties of not just your average Muslim, but even people who were in the DHS database and were labeled as potential threats, terrorists, et cetera, we're now focused on their civil rights and liberties more than what they may do. And it, it's just unconscionable for people to read in your book here that the civil rights and liberties of potential terrorists became more important than national security, right? Yes. I, I'm going to guess that people that are listening and watching now, their heads are probably already hurting. Because it's awfully difficult to absorb what, what we're talking about, that it actually happened. I mean, you would say, how could this happen? But it did happen. It's still happening today, again, using Raymond Ibrahim as an example. Well, where, where is the connection point? You know, where was the plug pulled out of the wall, so to speak? What moment in time can we go to to really build the foundation that what I'm telling you is really true? Well, it's not so hard. It happened in November of 2008. It's called the Holy Land Foundation trial. And, and what's, what's crazy, Phil, is that this speech that Obama gave in Cairo uh, at Al-Azhar, this was given six months after the 108 guilty verdicts were given out at the Holy Land Foundation trial, correct? That's my whole point, friend. There is an actual moment in time, just like the time moment in time when the jet touched the face of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. An exact specific moment in time when these things happen. And that is at the conclusion of the Holy Land Foundation trial, which was in November of 2008, where the federal government, I'm talking the Department of Justice in cooperation with the FBI and law, law enforcement agencies just like myself, mine, meaning Customs and Border Protection, and I'll put a parenthesis here. I actually provided information to the, the, the legal team with the DOJ that was in charge of the case in Dallas that became known as the Holy Land Foundation trial, providing them background information of individuals and organizations affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood Network, which primarily the organization was known as the Holy Land Foundation. And they were raising money across the country to support Hamas, a globally designated terrorist organization. And in this trial, it was proven irrefutably. There's no doubt about it. It's not sort of, kind of, a little bit shady, a couple question marks. No, irrefutably proven. The groups like Hamas and Islamic Society of North America and North American Islamic Trust and Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, a whole big alphabet soup, were proven to be linked to Hamas, a globally designated terrorist organization. At that point is when our country chose the road to the left or to the right, so to speak. We, we can't stand still. We have to go forward. And at the very moment when it was proven in federal court that these groups, these front groups like CARE, were affiliated directly with Hamas, rather than take the logical law enforcement step and shut them down through a sequence of trials and hearings, which was what the original plan was, we went the exact opposite direction. 
And we, instead of shutting them down, brought them into positions of influence and authority within the administration, where the f people that I was investigating, for example, before, now had access to exactly the same classified law enforcement database that I was using with the direct line of communication to the White House. And they were so tracking me and people like me. Instead of us tracking them, they began to track us, coming after law enforcement officers for doing the job that we took our oath to do. You know, and it's very Phil, after, surreal. After this it's like change Alice in Wonderland in, in where the Dormouse has a 45. He's dangerous. It's not funny anymore. You know, it's a very surreal thing to be involved in this shift. But it happened in November of 2008, and President Obama, in his A New Beginning speech, brought it out in front of the whole world. He hmm. wasn't going to follow up on the Holy Land Foundation trial, and he was true to his word. He never did. He was going to do the exact opposite. He was going to call these people friends, not only in the domestic counterterrorism arena, meaning here at home in America, but on the global level. He was going to form alliances with the Muslim Brotherhood, not only in the United States with groups like CARE, but entire countries, the whole structure of the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunisia and Algeria and Libya and Egypt and Syria. And that's exactly what he did. And, by and it, it them, was a Phil. It, it was a, a month after the whole structure on, of the Middle East. He gave the speech on June fourth, two thousand nine. On July nineteenth, two thousand nine, just a little over a month later, you wrote a, a, a memo to your supervisor about a disturbing new trend of Muslim airplane passengers creating a scene, cussing, screaming, and exhibiting other disruptive behavior after they were referred either to the baggage inspection or secondary inspection area for questioning. So pretty much that speech and all that was said publicly by different people pretty much gave uh, every Muslim the, the green light to make a fuss if they felt oppressed in any way. And guess what? All, all this change in terminology of what you should and shouldn't say and the uh, uh, oppression feeling that any Muslim may have uh, people don't even realize that these are things that fall underneath Sharia. If, if someone says, hey, don't offend Muslims, and you actually obey that command, well, you're just implementing aspects of Sharia on yourself. And you talk about in your book, uh, no surprise, that yes, the goal of Islam is to have a whole world under Sharia. And when the, the U.S. policy was moved from a war on terror uh, – and we aren't worried about uh, fighting jihadists, but rather just violent extremism in general and generalizing the entire issue. On 9-11, Phil, as you state in your book, uh, you'd already been studying Islam. Uh, Islam didn't become a threat on 9-11. It just became known as a threat on, the, on a global scale, or at least a United States scale. Uh, and so even today, I mean, uh, this the is being used uh, in, in this exact way, because when these uh, new orders were come out that came out to talk about civil rights and civil liberties, it went beyond your uh, your basic. Uh, we need to make sure that all Muslims in America uh, aren't targeted because of this. I mean, that that's obviously a given. That doesn't even need to be uh, said by the government. But it went beyond that from. It wasn't just a, we need to make sure that Muslims have American rights. It, it went all the way to the point where it was giving civil rights and liberties and just opening the door completely for every single Muslim in the entire world, regardless of what threat that they had to America that you documented in the uh, text system, which you were l later told to go ahead and scrub. And all these months, uh, these thousands of hours that you spent connecting all the dots uh, between different people who were threats to America and the ideologies that they held, you were told to get rid of this information. And you talk about all of that in your book, along with another 200 and, and, and so pages of going into all the details of what you discussed today. And of course, we can't even finish the story completely in this episode. I, again, I want to encourage people to get a copy of See Something, Say Nothing, a Homeland Security Officer Exposes the Government's Submission 
to Jihad. Get a used copy of it. Whatever you need to do just to get this information and get it to other people as well. Phil, we only have uh, about a minute and a half left. We need to let people know, if, if this is their first time watching this, that Muslims are people made in the image of God. They need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Islam is a religio-political system. About 80% of the Quran is political in nature. And we see how Sharia rules in different countries where people are living under that. And the goal is to have America under Sharia as well. At the same time, we need to know that we are in a spiritual battle, not a political one. Yes, there are political answers to certain aspects, but there is no long-term political answer to Islam. Islam is a religio-political system. The base of it is religious, which means it's spiritual, and a spiritual problem requires a spiritual solution. And of course, that's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please take a minute uh, for a closing statement of what you encourage people to do with the information that they can find in your book and the information they've received in this episode today. Uh, after they read it, what is the, uh, the to-do plan for your average American? Well, I'll put a word out there, apologetics. The, Paul writes that we should be a workman that rightly divides the word of truth, not be ashamed, and be ready to give an answer for everyone who asks about the hope that lies within us. Apologetics is important. Develop your own sense of apologetics between the theology of Islam and the theology of, of the Bible. Number two is I wanted to make a point about what you emphasized earlier, whether or not this had any bearing on people's lives. And remember Tashfeen Malik, the woman who was married to Saeed Farouk, and she and her husband killed the people in San Bernardino? You were mm -hmm. talking about civil rights and civil liberties, remember? Well, that policy led to people dying because they admitted a week after the attacks that they never looked at Tashveen Malik's social media. And the reason why is because they did not want to violate her privacy rights. But she's a foreign national. So they didn't look at her social media. And she'd been posting pro-jihad stuff on her social media for a long time. It was very obvious. So that was the end policy. That's why the book starts with the Tablighi Jumat case and ends with it, because it has to do with San Bernardino. So it's still real. In fact, it's so real that we just had another attack in Sri Lanka. That was a bombing by members of, Ta of uh, Ta Tawhid Jamaat, which is a close sister organization to Tablighi Jamaat. They're part of the same global organization. And just like here in America, the people in Sri Lanka ignored the warnings from the Indian intelligence agencies and ended up people dying because of it. It was preventable. Exactly. Just like San Bernardino was plausibly preventable. How can we say it wasn't when they deleted the information out of the law enforcement database? It made us blind to not only the individuals, but the organizations that were like a solar system of planets and stars orbiting around each other with Syed Farouk and Tashreen Malik. There was a whole network there, and law enforcement was discouraged from even looking at it, just like what happened and in Phil, Sri Lanka. I think the most frustrating part for people is that they will read in your book that you had connected all the dots, you had all the information, you talked about them in here before that event even happened. Oh, yeah. And again, people get see something, say nothing. My guest, again, is Philip Haney. Philip, thank you so much for being here on Colliding Worldviews and talking about this subject. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Friends, see something, say nothing. A Homeland Security officer exposes the government's submission to jihad. This connects all the dots between 9-11 and where we are today. Get a copy for yourself and for other people as well. Even if you can only find them used, get as many as you can on Amazon or wherever else that you buy books. It will connect the dots and it'll explain why the ongoing jihadist events that we see today will continue. Not because it's an aberration of true Islam, but because these people are following the Islamic sources, which line up right with, with Muhammad himself. It's not an aberration of Islam. This is Islam according to Muhammad. We need to realize that and realize again that the ultimate solution is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All people need to hear it, and all people includes all Muslims. We'll see you next time on Colliding Worldviews.